Hey everybody, hope you're enjoying Global Supply Chain Week. Uh, it's Greg Miller. I'm the senior editor with FreightWaves and American Shipper. Uh, and I am here with uh, Peter Sand, the chief shipping analyst at the shipping association BIMCO. And Peter's joining us all the way from Copenhagen. Peter, uh, thanks for being with us. It's always great to talk with you. Uh, it's a pleasure being on the show and, and being on this week. Uh, I think uh, the shipping market is interesting as always, but uh, it's great to be with you today. Yeah, so uh, so Peter and I are going to speak about the uh, the future of container shipping. Uh, very, very lofty subject. Uh, but before we get to that, Peter, if you could just take uh, a few minutes and tell us a little bit about what BIMCO is and what it does. Absolutely. Thanks for, for giving me that opportunity because uh, working in uh, the world's largest invisible industry, uh, well, it's like uh, Hotel California. Uh, once you start working in shipping, you can never leave. But, uh, but BIMCO is a global shipping association. We are headquartered in Copenhagen, Denmark, but with offices in Athens, London, Singapore and Shanghai. And uh, soon, well, we may open up in a, in a fifth place as well. Uh, we at least alluded to that uh, last year when, when setting up in London. We have approximately 1,900 members uh, across the globe in 120 nations. And what we do is basically uh, bring inside knowledge and, and detailed uh, assistance into uh, the boardrooms and, and chartering desks of our members. Uh, and, uh, and our membership basically range from the largest ship owners in the world to, to small local port agents and, and law firms. So, uh, so when speaking at, at IMO, for instance, where we hold a uh, observatory status, uh, we speak on behalf of, of basically the widest range of maritime companies and, and organizations, as, uh, as you can possibly imagine. And, and we're not focused on, on, on one uh, line of, of shipping, like container shipping or, or tangas. We cover all of it. So, uh, so should you be interested in, in having a, a, a chat with, uh, with, uh, with me or, or one of my colleagues, uh, colleagues, uh, please feel free to do so because we are open to business 24 seven. Thanks for uh, allowing me that introduction, Greg. Yeah, great. Okay, so the future of container shipping, I think before we get to the future, I want to talk about something that's happening right now uh, that informs the future. So essentially, the container liner business is incredibly consolidated due to a lot of ownership consolidation deals over the last decade and uh, a lot of alliance structures. And what we saw last year was that the uh, consolidated liner business was successfully able to manage its own capacity, which is something that we haven't seen before. And I think when we think about what's going to happen five, 10 years down the road, we first have to ask, uh, is this the new normal? Is this the way it's going to be? Or uh, uh, during the next time downturn, will we see yet another price war? Or if we don't see a price war, uh, will the regulators, whether in the EU or the United States or China, say, uh, you know, that's enough here? Um, so what do you think about uh, this idea of the consolidated liner business being sort of the new normal uh, model for the future? Oh, thanks for handing me such an easy question for a starter, Greg. <laughs> I think uh, I think uh, it's it's an incredible year what we have seen in 2020 and and unprecedented also in the way that that liners uh, managed uh, capacity to uh, to match that of demand because we come basically out of uh, three decades where liners have fiercely uh, fought a price war uh, focusing only on bringing the volumes on board their ships at any cost but what we basically saw at lightning speed last year was uh, was a magnificent and very very sharp cutting uh, sailings uh, out of the, the main uh, export areas, in particular uh, Far East Asia up front, uh, bringing, of course, uh, terrible volumes transported uh, during, in particular, the second quarter, and then this massive turnaround. Uh, so so is, this, uh, is this collusion by three alliances? No, I don't think so, because one year we should not change the way that the industry have, uh, have dealt with matters for, for, for many years. But in all fairness, I mean, 
2020 uh, turns out to be one of the most profitable years for lineup business. Fingers crossed 2021 could actually become even better. But it all, of course, hinges on not only the ability to match uh, the uh, uh, supply into the service lanes to that of demand, uh, but very much so also about uh, uh, being at the service of, of clients, because obviously that's what uh, what matters at the end of the day. And looking into the future of, of container shipping, we also need to, to focus on where are the future manufacturing hubs. Yeah, I mean, but just to go back to the consolidation, you know, I, I, I tend to wonder uh, anytime someone says the new normal, I think, you know, it, it's, it's, good, it's good to bet against that if I look 10 years in the future. Um, you know, I wonder if, if uh, you know, their, this consolidated aspect of the industry uh, is going to be able to be, uh, is going to be a forever thing. I, I don't know what you think about that, but. Uh... Yeah, yeah, well, um, I, I think I have it uh, more or less uh, down the same way as you have. We, we uh, at some point in time, we talked about uh, the next, 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 next normal. So, uh, so uh, the, the line I'm using nowadays is, is uh, sorry the new 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 normal uh, but now we're talking about the next normal uh, because we do not know uh, how long uh, everything will be i mean um, um, surely the world is ever changing at faster and faster pace uh, and, and that's basically why i also uh, put up the, the the big question here will liners continue to manage supply as they have been capable of doing in 2020 because obviously that was very successful in 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 in, in, in a profitable way, uh, but uh, but but the next normal uh, may be only one year further down the road when uh, when uh, when you and I are capable of traveling again, when demand reach a soft patch, and uh, and when the geopolitical aspects also of uh, of COVID nineteen starts to show its uh, perhaps ugly face. Uh, so uh, so the next normal be maybe already around the corner, uh, but uh, but but let's see about that one year at a time. Yeah, I mean, uh, another way that the uh, the current norm could change involves China. And we've talked about this in the past as well. But I mean, you know, China is a part of the alliance structure through Costco and the Ocean Alliance. Uh, but if you look at uh, the problems that uh, Chinese exporters have had uh, in the last couple of months, uh, you know, perhaps they're thinking, well, maybe this didn't isn't going so well. And, and China is the kind of country with it has the finances, it has the shipyards. If China decided to do so in the future, it could carry a lot more of its containerized goods on its own container ships. And frankly, uh, it could carry a lot more of its iron ore on its own bulkers and a lot more of its own oil on its own tankers. And, and this has been a, a theme in China for years. And I'm wondering, uh, looking forward, if you believe uh, that it's possible for China to really control a substantially larger amount uh, of its own cargo movements in the years ahead. I think if they would, they could. Uh, holding now uh, most uh, shipyards in the world with the biggest uh, shipbuilding capacity built up over uh, well less than two decades. Uh, this is just a matter of politics. Uh, I don't think uh, the Chinese are uh, interested in, in colliding with anyone, uh, but, uh, but they have a clear mind on what they want and, and they are... Um, uh, they, they, they know what they want and they have plenty of time. Um, one thing that, that also sets China aside from, uh, from at least uh, some of their main uh, customers in the liner business is, uh, is, uh, is the way that China is run. Uh, they don't need to set aside two years for, uh, for a presidency campaign every now and then. So they can basically decide uh, on, on multi-year. We know of the five-year plans. They basically lay down the structure, what would we like to achieve? And they basically achieve that in many times faster than that. So my point here is if, if China really wants all their imports and all their exports done on a Chinese flag fleet, they could do so. But I don't think it's in their interest. As long as they keep, I guess that's also what we have seen uh, with the um, interference uh, from, uh, from Beijing on the Trans-Pacific uh, freight rates uh, by the middle of uh, 2020. I mean, uh, they they are just keen that they can get their exports uh, out in the world. But, but apparently they are also sensitive on on freight rates that that may go too high and, and may uh, at least to some extent uh, impact their ability to 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 export uh, but uh, but i think uh, i think they um, 
they will still have a market for uh, for the uh, free and individual owners, uh, but uh, but we also see outside the liner business, uh, for instance in dry bulk, where they tend to uh, to build their own conveyor belts to supply themselves with uh, with with iron ore, for instance from Brazil or from uh, from Guinea Bissau. Yeah, I mean the way I look at it is you know China, the role of China has clearly grown over time, and you would think that that would continue, and I think the timing of that could depend on. Uh, for example, on the economy, I mean, who knows, you know, if there's some sort of uh, debt problem in China, that could slow things down. And on the other hand, on the geo geopolitical side of it, uh, if tensions with the United States, for, for example, were to increase, uh, more sanctions, maybe some, uh, you know, some shots fired in the South China Sea, then that could accelerate things. So uh, that's a big variable there for the future in China, I think. And I, next subject, I would say, would be trade flows. Um, if you look at the trade, and that this is really going to affect the structure of container shipping in the future. Right now, we have a significant, a significant amount of the trade flows are China, uh, Europe, and China, US, US on these giant head haul runs. Uh, but at the same time, if you think back during the trade war, everyone was talking about diversification of supply chains. Uh, during uh, COVID, everyone was talking about diversifying away from China. Uh, then again, uh, when I look at the U.S. cargo flows, most of it's coming from China now. So I guess diversification takes time. And then we have uh, topics like, for example, nearshoring, where uh, the U.S. could, for example, uh, 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 get more goods from places like Mexico. And then we have home shoring, where the idea of bringing the manufacturing back. And then we have ideas like 3D printing, where we, you know, we don't get something from a Chinese factory. We just print it out at home. And then on a less sci-fi level, we have robotics and automation where the factories of places like the United States could actually become more cost effective. You could actually, uh, if, if robotics advanced uh, quickly enough, you could it would be cheaper to manufacture something uh, in Alabama with a bunch of machines than it would in Vietnam with human workers. And, and how this evolves is going to have a tremendous effect on the the ton mile demand for container shipping in the future. And I'm just curious what you think about how this is going to all play out. I think you uh, you you touch upon those three elements that uh, that we also focus on in in uh, in our crystal ball and when, when we're trying to vision uh, the future of container shipping. Uh, there's the geopolitics, which I allude to, is uh, is, is 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 damaged by the current uh, blame game from from COVID-19, and of course also in the aftermath of the trade war. So we have a, a geopolitical level, which is like a, a top line. Then we have, of course, how are uh, the liners. Uh, going to, to operate their networks uh, going forward. Obviously, uh, they have a clear interest in having these uh, hub and spokes uh, uh, strategies uh, rolled out uh, with, uh, with, with still a significant cargo moved on, uh, on, on, on the main uh, trade lanes. Uh, more so than than setting up a bunch of port pairs, uh, even though that's uh, that's I guess it I guess it it, it, it becomes their claim to fame uh, on on a regular basis when they when they when they open up uh, new routes. Uh, but uh, but essentially what they would prefer is to fill up the very big ships, and we have only uh, recently seen also uh, uh, new orderings of uh, ultra large uh, container ships. So so the strategy seems clear from uh, the liner business point of views. And then thirdly, of course, uh, the shippers and those that, that, that rely massively on the, on the service that liners that deliver. That global supply chain have surely taken a lot of beating in, uh, in, in the past year. And, and a lot of that was merely an acceleration of what was already taking place during the trade war. Because what we have seen, and, and Greg, you know that at BIMCO, uh, we have followed quite closely the, the, the trade war and, and the developments uh, where we have seen manufacturing of, of specific products move away from China. But for the liner shipping business, importantly, they have moved to other destinations, uh, sorry, other origins in, in, in China, uh, like, sorry, in Vietnam, in, uh, in Cambodia, for instance. So it has remained within the Far East region. Uh, basically making still uh, possible for the liners uh, to keep uh, those uh, long hauls on high volumes. Uh, so, so obviously, uh, the, the, the big thing that could uh, that could reverse some of that uh, that trend, uh, which we basically call globalization 2.0 or something like that, because we're not going fast forward. Everything is globalized. We're 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 coming down a bit. Some of that, uh, if it's 
can be fully automated. Uh, you do so in your own backyard, where uh, where basically consumers can can pick up the goods themselves. Uh, but uh, but going forward into uh, to the next future, I think a combination of all those three, where the liners know exactly their strategy, what is it that they want to do. We see also retailers restructuring their supply chains, so it it will become more focused on having a contingency plan away from uh, from from 100% China to perhaps 80% China, 10% Vietnam, 10% Mexico. Uh, and then on top of it all, how will the uh, the, the new Biden administration, at least in, in, in the short run here, with uh, with also uh, uh, focus on, on the South China Sea, how will those uh, geopolitics uh, spill over? Um, and in conclusion, I think, uh, Sometimes, at least in the short run, you can you can ov- only overestimate the importance of the White House when 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 talking about geopolitics, because as you can see, from uh, from um, the uh, imports of goods into to North America and uh, particularly in the second half of, of last year and also uh, starting in 2021, I mean the Chinese uh, uh, the, the American consumers they really dig the uh, the Chinese uh, consumer goods. So uh, so uh, that that goes a bit against the grain of, of politics. Yeah, I mean, the two things I would say is, you know, number one, it it seems like it's very difficult to change some of these supply chains in the thick of a crisis. So we hear about, hear about this diversification, but, you know, uh, people are rushing to get these goods in. So now may not be the time. And another thing I would say is that, you know, this COVID uh, crisis has actually in, in several ways uh, incentivized and pushed forward things like automation and uh uh, you know, you know, with especially with things like minimum wages and so forth and, and social distancing. So it could accelerate it there. But this idea of the trade flows brings us to the next topic, which is the size of the ships of the future. You know, over the last decade, we've seen you know a lot of ships that were built, uh, very, very large ships, 20,000, 20 foot equivalent units or TEUs or larger. Uh, and these are primarily designed for these big headhaul trades, Asia to Europe, Asia to the U.S., uh, and um, we've seen a lot of diseconomies of scale during this current uh, capacity crunch where it's very, very difficult to unload these large ships and we're seeing a lot of port congestion. On the other hand, uh, in the fourth quarter, if you look at the orders, uh, there was a, about 25 vessels that were ordered uh, that are 20,000 TEUs or larger. So uh, we don't look like we're done with it yet. but. What do you think about the size of the ships? If you look at what we just talked about with the changes of the trade lanes, do you think maybe that uh, we built these ships too big? I mean, there's nothing we can do with them for the next 20 years, but do you think we shot too high? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think we're, we're just seeing a constant development of, of, of the global network of, of liner shipping. And I think what we have seen over the past decade also uh, developing quite clearly is that the middle of the market, say ships ranging from 5,000 to, to 12,000, that's more or less a gap there. It, it seems as if that's a, that's a size uh, no liner uh, is, is, is really uh, making use of right now, at least uh, for, for, for the future. Uh, so, so we're talking about uh, feeder services up to 5,000. We're talking about port to port uh, with uh, with 12,000, 15,000. That once was the behemoth of the fleets, but now are the mid-sized fleet. And, and then we basically have these uh, these uh, still ultra-large uh, container ships uh, with, uh, with uh, well, we, we, we do not have that many. I mean, there's, uh, there's less than 200, depending on where you, uh, where you cut the pie. Uh, and, and they will still uh, remain plying a trade into, uh, into Europe in particular, but also when, uh, when the U.S. West Coast uh, uh, get, uh, get its act together or, or get demand as high as possible, uh, they will also uh, go over there. So I think we, we, are, we are just get, getting to see it much more clearly with a clear distinction between that, uh, that uh, uh, port to port for, for, the, uh, for the 8 to 12,000 and, and the rest is, uh, is hub and spoke. I think that is, uh, that is an interesting development and also a, uh, a very cost efficient way and something that benefits uh, all, uh, not only clients, but also uh, or the shippers, but also the liners. Yeah, this is all very interesting. Uh, and, you know, uh, future of container shipping, we could sit here and talk about this all day. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you again uh, for participating in Global Supply Chain Week. As always, it's always been very interesting uh, to talk with you. And if anyone out there needs to reach out to you, could you explain, you know, how, how they can get in contact with you? 
Yeah, indeed. Uh, go to uh, bimco.org. Uh, there's uh, there's plenty of uh, contact information there. Should you uh, be uh, interested in writing directly to me, uh, just put a PS for Peter San in front of uh, at bimco.org. I shall be very happy to to take any comments or questions that you may have on uh, online shipping or if you are uh, interested in, uh, in, in anything else from uh, from BIMCO contracts and clauses, a membership or a publication, inside knowledge into uh, to ice, for instance, ice conditions uh, anywhere in the world from uh, from the Sea of Azov to uh, to the uh, Luthien or the uh, Alaskas. Um, I mean, that's uh, that's what we got. Uh, we're we're here to uh, to to make you uh, a better company in the in the world of shipping, and 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 that's basically what we have been doing since uh, 1905. So uh, so been around the block for for more than a a, a century. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic to talk to you. Great speaking. Likewise, Greg. Thanks for having me. Take care. Sure.